Hello, and welcome to Fintech Wire's Innovators Podcast. My name is Ed Medina, and I'm the editor of Fintech Wire. In today's episode, we're asking, how can insurance companies compete and win in a rapidly changing industry? Insurers can sometimes be slow to adopt new technology and processes that are increasingly needed to not only survive, but also thrive. To help us understand what insurers are up against, we've invited Aaron Wright, Director of Strategy at Ernix, to join us. Aaron and his team at Ernix produce an annual trends report surveying 400 insurance executives to understand what they're thinking about and how they're reacting to this change. Aaron, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the show. Can you tell us about yourself and Ernix, please? So, uh, as you said, my uh, name is Aaron Wright. I'm the Director of Strategy at Ernix. Um, I have been in the insurance industry uh, for just about 25 years. Um, I have worked at several large carriers uh, within the United States. Uh, started off as an actuary. I'm also a, an underwriter, a CPCU. And uh, I've done everything from catastrophe management to uh, reinsurance to pricing, um, mostly in the personal line space. Um, but uh, now I work for Ernix and I get to take that industry experience and really uh, bring it into the technology business. When it comes to what Ernix does, uh, we are really a company that focuses on helping insurers make intelligent operational decisions, really around the space of pricing, rating, and underwriting. Uh, we're trying to bring together the all the analytics, modeling, AI, and ML, um, the decision-making process, forecasting, things like that, and then tie it directly in a governed way into uh, putting that into the production space so that companies can really have fast speed to market in making decisions and operationalizing those decisions. Thank you, Aaron. Also joining us today is veteran insurance industry thought leader, Rob McIsaac. Rob is a former executive principal at Novarica and CEO and president at consultant RPM Ventures NC. Rob, welcome to the show. Great. Well, thanks for having me, Ed. It's terrific to be with you and Aaron. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to share some of our insights and perspective. Uh, as you say, a uh, veteran in this case means I've uh, spent 45 years in the insurance industry. A little hard for me to believe. Never planned to stay. I took a summer intern job uh, that was supposed to last for a couple of months. And as I'm fond of saying, nothing seems to be more permanent in insurance than a temporary solution. So here I am. But uh, I spent more than 30 years uh, working in carriers, uh, started actually in the technology world, uh, worked in operations and in finance as well, worked in group insurance and individual insurance as well as the property and casualty world, uh, wound up uh, working as the chief information officer and chief technology officer for a number of major companies, uh, Prudential Insurance on the divisional level, the same at Guardian Insurance and Nationwide, also was the enterprise CIO for an accident health company called Pencorp Financial, and then did a tour of duty uh, as the CIO for a top 50 US bank. So I may be one of the few people you meet who's actually been a CIO in both property and casualty insurance, life and annuities, as well as uh, the banking realm. I did spend the last uh, more than 10 years helping to build Novarica as a research and advisory firm for insurance executives on the technology side. Uh, after that firm was sold, uh, some partners and I set up a new company called RPM Ventures NC, and we are continuing to work with senior executives to help them understand through our insights how to make better and more informed decisions in a world, as Aaron and Ernix's study point out, uh, that is dynamic, changing very quickly with a lot of opportunity out there, but also some notable risks. So it's really great to be with you all this morning. You too, Rob, and thanks for joining us, the both of you. Aaron, let's start with the survey. This is Ernix's second annual trends report, and you've overseen it since its creation. Why did you start this project, and what market and industry changes have you seen? Thanks, Ed. Well, the main reason we do this is because Ernix wants to continue to make positive contributions to the insurance industry. I'm an insurance guy through and through. I love this stuff. I actually joined Ernix after, as I said, many years of working at Carries because I saw how Ernix was filling a gap in the industry and making meaningful change in modernizing how operational decisions are being made. After I joined Ernix, I've had countless discussions with our customers and the challenges that they were facing. Part of why we commissioned this survey is to supplement the anecdotal feedback 
with broader industry data. From a strategy perspective, I wanted to ensure that our continued product roadmap is aligned with industry needs. Now, uh, of course, now that we have this data, we can share it with the industry. As an insurance executive, I would often wonder if my challenges that I was facing were unique and whether I was focusing on the right challenges. Maybe even if there were better ways to be able to tackle these challenges going forward. And this is why we take our survey data and write up an industry report. While last surveys last year was focused on operational modernization activities, this year's survey centered on understanding the macroeconomic and other change forces that are facing companies. It really gives us insight into what types of things companies are doing in response to these things. A common trend that came through on both surveys was that a company's legacy infrastructure really slows down innovation and reduces the agility needed to adjust to our changing industry environment. Well, thanks, Aaron. Rob, your thoughts on the report? Yeah, I, I thought it was a fascinating report to read, and I appreciated the opportunity to get an early look at it. I think, that, as Aaron pointed out, carriers really need to get a better sense of not only what the challenges are that are in front of them, but how things are operating across the bands of the industry that they're in. In, in some cases, creating new science isn't really necessary. It's really valid to understand how things are being operationalized in a particular geography or in a particular segment. And I thought one of the things that was really interesting about the report was the fact that you did do a segmentation by geography. So looking at North America versus other geographies. And then you also did another cut looking at carriers above a certain size versus smaller carriers. And again, many of the problem statements or challenges and issues permeate the industry overall. But if you can get a much more honed focus, it actually make the, makes the insights much more actionable. And I thought that was one of the really interesting formatting elements that came through here. Thank you, Rob. So, Aaron, as you're evaluating the insurance industry on a global level, what are some of the differences that you notice? Are there fundamental changes in different parts of the world? And if so, what does that mean for Ernix and your solutions? Well, as you mentioned before, the survey was administered to 400 executives from around the globe. So when examining the results, I saw pretty good consistency across geography. But as Rob mentioned, digging down deeper, there are a few spots where we saw some differences. So let me just give you a few examples. So when asked whether their company used predictive models to anticipate customer reactions to specific products or services, 30% of North American companies versus 15% of European companies said that they already do this today. Additionally, those North American companies not already doing this seem to feel more urgency, with almost 70% of the remaining North American companies having plans to do this within the next two years, versus in Europe, it was only about 40%. Another example, um, another example would be, uh, while every demographic who answered the survey thought that the use of third-party data would increase, European companies estimated a 5.7% increase in investment in third-party data expense, while it was 3.7% in North America. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot when you look at the amounts that uh, these companies actually put into their third-party data. Uh, it's a bit of a difference. Another subject that European executives reported being ahead on was the use of generative AI technologies, such as like ChatGPT. 42% of them reported it being used within their companies today versus only 25% in North America. The last difference I'll point out uh, was in the use of transparent AI. In case your listeners aren't as familiar with that term, I've heard it defined as explainable AI. Many forms of AI and machine learning result in black box models. That makes it really difficult to explain why a particular answer was reached. Explainable AI is where you harness the advanced analytics, but maintain the explainability necessary for transparency to the business and customers. Every executive in our survey has plans to utilize transparent AI in the next few years, but more than a quarter of North American executives are currently doing this. In Europe, that number is only 14%. So as you can see, there are some differences in every region that have to be addressed and supported, but overall, I'll say that the consumers need the same thing. They want the ability to 
utilize their data to drive decision making using cutting edge analytics. They want the agility and speed to market necessary to adapt to their changing environment and explore innovative solutions. And they want these operational decisions to be fully governed and repeatable. Uh, so when it comes to these needs, I will tell you that Ernix definitely delivers. Well, thanks, Aaron. And Rob, your thoughts on some of these global differences, generative AI or explainable AI? Yeah, and no, I think this is a really interesting space when you start to talk about the application of any emerging technologies, generative AI uh, and other flavors of that just being but one example. I think it's uh, really important to understand as we look at a highly regulated industry like insurance, that that permeates itself into the things that carriers do, but that the regulations themselves vary significantly from geography to geography. So for instance, you may well have national regulatory environments in some places like the UK, you could have Uber national requirements or structures in place in places like the EU. Back here in North America, the United States, of course, is regulated at the state level, and you have 57 of those when you think about the different geographies that include Washington, D.C. and the protectorates. And so for carriers there, it's even different than it is north of the border, where in Canada you have a federal and a provincial separation of responsibilities. So I think carriers are very mindful of the need to both be aware of how they want to use the technologies that emerge in order to create value for themselves. And at the same time, they're very mindful of the potential risks of getting ahead of themselves by doing things that might put them on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. And to be clear, that's not a good thing when you're doing things that have created uh, commercial angst uh, or regulatory reviews. So I think what you've got is sort of an interesting pressurization of the system as companies understand, to Aaron's point, that you've got to be prepared to deal with the fact that this is a very fast moving space. And if you cede ground to others, you may well have a difficult time making that ground back up. And at the same time, you don't want to go too fast. So looking at, at where you're going to find guidance is important. In the United States here, we've seen the NAIC offer some guidance. Uh, we've seen uh, recently it, uh, the White House offering not insurance specific, but some other types of guidance. Um, we've seen European capitals move uh, with varying paces around how they see this space in general. So uh, again, I think it's really important to understand that as a context, then, then the report makes even more sense as you peel that onion. Absolutely. And thanks for that, Rob. So Aaron, switching gears here. Is the insurance industry slow to adopt new tech and new processes, or does it get an unfair rap? Uh, it, it is really easy to look from the outside end of the insurance industry and say that we're slow to adopt new tech and new processes. The reality is that there are many brilliant people within the industry that want to do things better, but turning a big ship takes time. <laughs> In our survey, we asked these 400 executives what was holding them back from innovation. Now, from a process perspective, they said it was leadership apathy and people saying, maybe this is good enough for now. Now, I have been one of the people inside an insurance company patching up processes, technology with duct tape and chewing gum. Now, we can get it to work, but at some point, this Jenga tower that we've built will come falling down. And it really is going to be up to us as leaders within the industry to paint that picture from within our companies to get people past their apathy. Now, both, year, both years of the survey, we also asked a question around what was holding them back from innovating from a technology perspective. And these executives said that their legacy technology was what was holding them back. Now, it's not uncommon <laughs> for companies to have 50 amazing ideas sitting on a shelf somewhere. But when the cost of implementing innovation is weighed down by retrofitting your legacy technology, your cost-benefit analysis will never move forward. Now, the good news is that Ernix has seen many companies that have come to this realization and are doing something about it. It's an exciting time for the industry, and I actually believe that the slow trickle of new tech and innovation from companies is about to explode as the bottle cap comes off and allows these companies to execute all of these brilliant ideas that they really have just sitting on a shelf. I love that analogy of the bottle cap. Thanks, Aaron. Rob, is the industry slow? What's holding them back from implementing some of these technologies if they have them 
sitting on the shelf, as Aaron said. So I think to build on what Aaron said, this is an industry that certainly compared to others appears to be slow to adopt technology changes and advances, but in many cases for good reason, starting with the regulatory frameworks that are there that just don't apply if you're in a retail space. Another thing that I think is important to look at is to peel the industry and look at it at a more granular level that if you look at things like liability tails, you'll find that there is a correlation between the length of the tail and the speed with which things are deployed within the business. So my background has allowed me to look at this in different ways, but one of the things I like to say is the fastest adoption of new technology and new process around it actually happens in retail banking if you have a, if you have a broad enough financial services lens because very short liability tails, very high transaction volumes, very low switching costs. When you get into the property and casualty world, for insurance, it's still high transaction volumes and it's still short liability tails, but it's uh, and, and it is relatively high transaction volume, but you still have risks that you need to accommodate. You've got these things that need to be factored in. And so I think that's part of what happens here is just, the risks are different. The regulatory framework is different. I think Aaron's point about uh, the bottle cap coming off and people being able to deploy new technology and take advantage of all of that, I think that's a really interesting perspective and important because one of the things that we see frequently delaying or uh, impacting people's ability inside insurance companies to deploy new technology and make some of these advances actually has more to do with some of the legacy business processes that may exist. And in many instances, what you find is that as projects get deployed, one of the things that happens is that people try and recreate legacy business process with new technology, or as we like to say, it's like paving a cow path. So some of that ambivalence or that lack of commitment on the executive side of insurance companies really needs to be about how do you come up with a collaborative uh, sense of how technology and operations together can move the ball forward. And I think one of the things that we've talked about for years, but which is really coming to fruition now, is that it's almost impossible to have a conversation about legacy technology and not understand that risks can be increased because of the fact that in many instances, you are starting to see some of the knowledge around how to manage those old systems, a trip from organizations because the youngest baby boomer, as an example, is about to turn 60 years old. Now, I'm here to tell you 60 is not old, but the reality of it is that many companies have not created good mechanisms for managing the knowledge around running those old systems, and the risks about that can just be huge. So Aaron's point about this is a good time to be getting after this. Yes, it's about innovation. Yes, it's about technology. Yes, it's about competitive positioning. And absolutely, it's about risk mitigation. Well, thanks for that, Rob. This concludes the first part of our discussion with Aaron Wright of Ernix and Rob McIsaac. If you're interested in hearing more from Aaron and Rob, join us again for part two, when they talk about how insurers are confronting industry changes and data challenges They'll also take us through some of their new initiatives. We release new innovators podcasts every week at FinTech Wire. We are also on Apple iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, and Podbean. You can find links to all of this as well as transcripts at fintechwire forward slash podcast. So check back for new episodes and we appreciate you listening. <laughs>